Okay, so it just turned 5.03, so we have a lot to cover in today's session, so I think we're just going to go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm sure uh, more people will kind of shuffle in as we go along, uh, but thank you everybody for being here. Uh, thank you for to those who are joining us uh, from the previous session on Tuesday. Uh, we had a really fantastic presentation by Eugene Lowe, who is the founding principal of 1010 Design and also uh, a bamboo advocate with Better Bamboo Buildings. One second. Sorry about that. I have uh, the live feed playing on my on my computer, so there's a weird kickback that you might have heard there. Um, anyways, yes, thank you very much to Eugen, who's joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Very exciting to have an international speaker with us today. Um, Eugen is gracious enough to join us once again. Um, Tuesday, he covered his uh, trajectory from conventional architecture into bamboo architecture. Today, he'll be giving just a short talk, uh, really diving into the material that is bamboo. Uh, so we're really excited to learn more about it, both from this presentation that Eugen is giving and also then um, followed by our, our hands-on activity, which will be led by a couple of our materials lab researchers. Um, so thank you everyone for being here with us today. Um, if you don't mind, um, if you are able to turn on your video feeds, uh, just joining me in a welcome to uh, Eugen. This is just kind of a way that we can visually show our um, appreciation for him. So thank you all. <laughs> okay. And with that, I'll hand things over to Eugene. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Very good to be here again to join you guys. Um, it was a good session we had uh, on Tuesday. And today we're gonna really jump into the material itself, bamboo as material, and I will Stop sharing my screen. So, yeah, my my involvement with bamboo now is coming up to only six years. I'm still learning every day, every day. It is a very intriguing and re-emergent material. Um, and I'll dive straight in. Bamboo is like a pipe, right? It's like a pipe with sections. And there are many bundles, what you call vascular bundles, as you can see here. And these vascular bundles are forming around the bamboo itself, uh, becoming denser on the surface of the bamboo here. And the skin of the bamboo is actually a silica layer, right? It is smooth and it is also gives bamboo a bit of hardness as well. But you can imagine all these vascular bundles are forming linear strings that give strength to the bamboo tube. And at certain intervals, they are what we call nodes. Again, this gives it strength and the disc itself uh, throughout the bamboo cone, this is where the strength is near the nodes as well, right? Um, zooming in closely, you can see the vascular bundles getting denser and denser as we go towards the surface of the bamboo. Um, some idea of, of how the bundles are, all these strings. Um, here, you can see how bamboo actually is not so strong along the axis. It can easily crack as well, right? Because there are no cross fibers going across this way. So it's very linear in a sense. And I want to go through with you the general properties of bamboo, right? We don't always just push for positive stuff in bamboo. Bamboo, you have to treat carefully. Otherwise, it can also come back at you negatively. Uh, bamboo deteriorates, right? It can rot. Um, and if you're not careful, you don't protect it from sunlight, from, from damp. This is what happens, right? At the base of a fence. So many people raise bamboo up above the ground so that the damp and the wetness doesn't get on it. Um, you have to really protect it 
by preventive design on a first basis, first principles basis. If you want to apply bamboo to buildings, to structures and installations, always think about how you can prevent bamboo from rotting by protecting it from sunlight and from rain and from damp. It also gets attacked by fungus, as you can see here, right? Um, over within a few months, right? If you stick it in the ground, this is what happens. Um, fungus starts growing as well, and it gets into the bamboo and really lowers its structural strength. With proper harvesting, bamboo will not crack or shrink. But if you harvest it too early, it's possible that the bamboo can actually shrink and that causes a lot of problems. And bamboo also can easily disfigure and scratch if you're not careful with it. And I've seen many people when they harvest bamboo in the jungle and they drag it along without taking too much care against tree trunks and this is what happens, right? It gets scratched and the silica layer gets uh, disfigured and this shows up in your buildings, which is unfortunate. Of course, bamboo is not as straight as a steel pipe, right? Uh, uh, it sort of not only bends, but it twists and it tapers as well, right? As it goes from the base, thick from the base, and then thinner all the way up uh, over its 30 meter length, if you like. And when we work with bamboo, we do not assume that the bamboo is straight. So you have to design for it, you have to design uh, for bamboo's uh, unique features. Of course, bamboo being a natural material like timber, it gets eaten by bugs. And we need to make sure that some protection is offered or the bamboo building or bamboo structures that they put up within a few months to a couple of years, it gets infested by things like uh, powder post beetles and the various kinds of insects that go in and eat the sugars and the starches inside the pole itself. So if we look at bamboo treatment methods, right, there are many methods uh, from the past, non-chemical or chemical methods. Um, with non-chemical Traditionally, people have smoked bamboo before. They've smoked it, they've baked it, and they've also whitewashed it. Right? Um, and, and some of them soak it in seawater as well. So these are more of the traditional and remote areas where they cannot afford even to buy chemicals as well. And that's been done traditionally, especially in Asia, in India, in South America. Chemically, you can do it with freemite, which is more natural, um, not as effective. And generally, the industry standard, if you like, for treatment of bamboo against um, pests and against rotting is boric acid and borax, a mixture of boric acid and borax, which you can actually buy now um, and then actually mix it with water. Um, there are also other chemicals in the past that have not been really good. They are a lot more toxic, things like CCA, uh, things chromium, copper, arsenic, right? It's a bit too toxic to, to be used nowadays, right? I think some countries still use them. So here you can see some pictures of different ways of treatment. I will quickly go through um, as well. Five ways of, of treating it, right? Um, examples of chemical treatment. Um, the first one is to drill, to drill and then to inject. These are more for thinner bamboo and, and bamboo that's less bulky that you can actually inject uh, chemicals into the bamboo to treat it. Um, VSD or vertical soak diffusion is where you use the capillary action of the bamboo. Uh, to pour in at the top or sometimes even to just soak it and it comes up through capillary action and through the walls of the bamboo and it gets treated that way. The bushery method is by pressure. 
right? You're applying up, you're pumping bamboo, pumping chemicals into the bamboo. Uh, and the fourth one is to soak, just soaking it in a, in a huge tub, uh, weighing it down and then soaking it for at least 48 hours, sometimes a lot more. Um, and the last method is to heat, heat and soak almost to boiling point up to 60 degrees um, centigrade. And then that is left to soak for a bit as well. This is a very effective method, the last method. And many people are using it nowadays, um, although you create, do create a lot of pollution. Um, in areas where, which are remote, you can actually dig a trench and soak with a tarp, pour in the chemicals and soak it. And this is also pretty popular. If you treat bamboo well, and if you apply if it finishes right, it can look really good. But if not, it can deteriorate very quickly. I wanted also to talk a bit about modeling. This is a bit of an aside that um, in our work in designing buildings, we use bamboo to model bamboo, right? This is great because it's bamboo on bamboo. Uh, the actual material we are building with or designing and building with is used to model the buildings in the early stages. Um, these are some examples. Um, and bamboo being bamboo, you get a chance to play with it and organic forms arise. It is not a very squared off material. Uh, it's not meant to be boxy all the time like other materials, but it gives you a chance to, to really go a bit crazy, right? Or organic. Here are some examples of uh, some of the models created in my journey, some with uh, university students and some of my own projects as well where we are actually using the bamboo that we're gonna build with to model at various scales. Um, a lot of the work also features prototypes as well. You actually build full scale prototypes of the bamboo. I don't have many photos to show, um, but bamboo models as a whole are a very important process to the construction, right? We actually use the model quite a lot more than the drawings during construction, believe it or not. This is uh, Budi, uh, one of my senior architects at Ibuku at that time, going for a meeting, right? He's going for a, a client meeting, um, more with two models rather than drawings, right? Um, it is surprising how clients uh, get more excited from the model uh, and spend more time discussing the model than even wanting to look at the drawings. Um, the models somehow give a different flavor to the building. And you can see a lot of the process is going through the models uh, at Ibuku itself. Uh, we had a section of modelers. We had five uh, bamboo modelers working full time for us. On site, the model, the workers, the artisans refer to the model a lot more than the drawings. They only refer to the drawings when there's a problem, right? Or when they want to look at the detail. If not, they will just go and work based on the model itself, um, which is an interesting difference right, compared to conventional architecture. Here are a few more to show you some examples of models. So yeah. Again, summarizing, bamboo is hollow and cylindrical. It's a cylinder. It's got nodes and diaphragms or discs at uh, regular intervals, right? It is longitudinal and the fibers are denser towards the outside of the cylinder. It tapers and the wall thickness also changes, right? It is not that regular. Um, and there is variation in length, in strength and of course, on the surface of the calm, it is slippery and slightly harder. So some of the issues with connecting bamboo, right? We're gonna, gonna connect bamboo uh, later on in, in the actual workshop. Um, it being round and hollow makes it pretty difficult to connect either this way or longitudinally or cross, right? It's harder to connect. Um, it is strong in the longitudinal section, but 
weaker in the cross section when it's pierced. Uh, it's got low shear strength and it can split, right? It can split very easily as you can see here and here. So the jointing methods that have been evolved um, are a response to these criteria, right? And it's been slowly improved throughout the years of how bamboo is joined. Um, we can join bamboo, we can sort of group them in three groups, right? Of how bamboo is joined, right? The first one being traditional or vernacular groups, uh, with or without dowels. And the second is simply bolted joints. The third is, of course, more engineered connections, right? three uh, different groups, as you can see here. I've also tried to divide them into further categories or types of joints, which we'll go through uh, very shortly. This, this slide really is about preparing bamboo. Right? Um, I still do feel that artisans are needed. Uh, you cannot really manufacture these kind of joints. Um, you need to have a skill with your hand and with a knife. And these fish mouths, this is a double fish mouth, this is a fish mouth joint that is produced from these tools, right? A, a, a very basic chisel, a knife and a mallet, wooden mallet. Um, and the fit of it, as you can see here, makes the joint really more effective and efficient and tight. Um, it's very hard to do with a, a mechanical or electrical saw or tool. So the first method that we're going to through, go through is lashings of how um, various forms, more traditional of just basic rattan, rattan or bamboo, um, strings you can lash and some with pierced or drilled holes crisscrossing and others with even modern modern rope. Uh, I think we'll go through some lashings later on as well. There's many many uh, methods of lashing. You can lash bamboo uh, strips to make beams right curved beams uh, you can lash columns together or you can make them decorative um, this one i took in fiji right? this these two i think these two pictures were in fiji um, you can use lashings as a form of structural fixing and also decoration right to make it look nice this is bamboo rope uh, in bali some joints emulate timber and again in my opinion it is hard right when you're trying to do a half joint with a bamboo pole and it really looks weird and it's not efficient this kind of joint uh, hardly works well uh, if it's solid timber fair enough right or joints like this where potentially there's a lot of weakness here and here but there are people that try to use uh, timber style joints uh, uh, but something that I don't really go for that much. When you join bamboo um, longitudinally, this is an interesting one that happens a lot where bamboo lengths are limited and you want a longer bamboo member. We use dowels. So inside of this is another bamboo pole, right? If you can imagine in here, it's already a bamboo pole or a piece of timber a cylindrical piece of timber is in here. Uh, it is drilled and then bamboo dowels are then uh, hammered through with wood glue. The good thing about this joint is, is bamboo joining bamboo, right? There's no differential and it is very effective. All these will be cut off at these points and you will just see a little gap and they are almost molded together and, and wood glued together. And that's another, it's just the joint that you see, right? And more pin joints or dowel joints. That all these need a bit of knife work 
to make it really blend into the column itself, yeah. These happen a lot in universities and uh, sort of places of learning where I think uh, the participants really want to either 3D print or manufacture a, a joint uh, or recycling or repurposing from plastics to make joints. Um, not many have succeeded to move into actual practice where people are joining uh, stuff for buildings. Um, this was an example of a prototype which was okay, worked out, um, but a lot more on furniture, on uh, bicycles uh, happening with, with joining bamboo and, and certain installations as well, uh, which are possible. The high tech or steel joint is, is sort of an offshoot from architects just continuing their the uh, sort of familiarity with uh, detailing steel buildings and then using it to work with bamboo. Um, a lot of these happen more in exhibition buildings. I've seen many different variants, especially in uh, the international expos, uh, building expos where people have more budget uh, to experiment. Um, if it is a building that you're building, say, you know, in Bangladesh and all that, you're not, you won't be using this kind of details, right? Uh, if it's a community building, but if it's a, you have a bigger budget, you can start thinking about molding steel into these kind of shapes um, to work with bamboo. Each time you pierce or drill through bamboo, you, you create a point of weakness, which you need to know how to address, right? Um, the hollow causes an issue and you either need to fill the hollow or make sure that the bamboo doesn't crack at its point of weakness. So that is important for us to note. Some more common ways to join bamboo in my experience is using uh, steel bolts, um, especially if you are using your, your constructing for places of residence, right? Habitable buildings and public buildings. You cannot afford just to use uh, bamboo dowels. You need to ensure that there's adequate strength. So steel bolt through with a nut and a washer. Um, in the less structural joints, you can get away with uh, bamboo dowels, right? A dowel here and a dowel or a pin across. I've tried to show some direction of how the dowel is. Um, so that gives you an example of what happens a lot in Asia people using steel bolts to connect uh, the basic structural joints. Filling bamboo gives it a lot more strength, yeah? Strengthens up the pipe rather than creating this uh, pressure that makes the bamboo crack. Um, using bamboo to fill bamboo, uh, that's what we normally do in areas of uh, weakness. This one I'm showing you is a example of uh, the workers actually sitting down and chilling and doing their bamboo pins right from from cutting bamboo into pieces and then sort of rounding them up some examples of dowels and how they are joined and i also wanted to show you yeah the actual bolts um, these are very standard bolt and and the washers um, this one is a steel bolt with an eye. Um, example will be here. The bolt goes through, the eye is here, and then another bolt is used to, to connect, to hold it in place. You still need the knife work to get this fish mouth going so that it's rounded and sits well. And this, you can see now, we are strapping this, right? We're strapping this up so that it gives it strength. Um, other workers or constructors fill this with mortar. Right, cement mortar, fill it up uh, so that it's solid and then it gives it a lot more uh, strength for the joint. If you don't like these, uh, these can, this can and may crack right along this axis here and here. Okay. That is it in general. Um, try to make it uh, quick. Um, I'll now open it up for questions, I guess.
Yeah, so you can all uh, feel free to just jump in with a question if you have it, or if you feel more comfortable, you can um, throw it in the chat and we can relay it for you. But I think we have time for maybe two questions before we need to move on to the, to the hands-on portion. I guess um, one question that I have is uh, on the, the question of filling the ends. Are there other materials that uh, you know of that are used to strengthen them? I think you mentioned the kind of packing the ends with other bamboo strips or filling them with concrete. Um, yeah, there are various methods, obviously. Let's go through them. I mean, the basic one or the best one I would say would be to use bamboo so that it's bamboo on bamboo. Um, normally the base of the calm, where the bamboo comb thickens up near the root, um, has got very thick bamboo. You can get them as thick as like uh, 6 cm, 4 inches, 3 inches thick. Um, you can use those as infill. Um, again, you need to be good with a knife to be able to do that. Um, nowadays, many people shortcut it by using cement mortar and then just filling it up, plugging the hole first at the end, plugging the disc and then filling it up and then uh, waiting for it to dry up. Um, there's a lot of humidity issues as well where the mortar is wet. So the bamboo has got to be also stabilized. If not, the bamboo absorbs the water and then causes either expansion or shrinkage issues, right? The bamboo has got to be quite dry already. Right? Um, I've not seen a lot more other materials. I mean, it's worth exploring as well to see, but uh, I think bamboo or mortar or timber works well as infill material. Fantastic. Um, and it looks like that's uh, somewhat related to our final question for this section. Uh, Kate, did you want to go ahead and, and ask that? Sure. sure. Um, I had a couple of questions there. One well, one primarily that I'm really interested in, which is flame finishing. Um, I've seen that used for sort of handheld products or for furniture, but do you ever use a, an architectural scale? We have. Um, we One of the more uppity terms we call it was carbonizing, right? Um, showing a flame on it. Uh, we have used them to finish as a finishing method to make the bamboo uh, more of a, a sort of black, gray, trendy finish, uh, especially on floors. We use bamboo splits. So the silica, silica is actually a blonde or, or, or brown color, right? Honey color, naturally. Um, but we can actually throw a flame over it and then make it more of a darker color. Um, that is quite, quite interesting to do. Um, and of course, you can use heat to bend bamboo, right? Uh, in my blog, I've got a, an article about bending bamboo where you can use heat to actually bend it. But to cure it uh, with heat, uh, I think it's a bit more, I haven't seen a lot of it curing, but more finishing, yes. Yeah. yeah. Finishing and bending bamboo, for sure. You can find a lot of articles online on it. Thank you. And I, I don't know if you addressed this earlier, but do, uh, is it, appropriate to use bamboo for architectural scale work in colder climates or I'm from Ireland originally would it be a really bad idea to use it in Ireland? Um, it is primarily good in where where bamboo thrives is where you should use bamboo solidly right um, there are bamboo applications in even Norway, right? Or, or North Europe, where people use it uh, as cladding, not structurally, but as a cladding material in, in car parks. I've seen, I think, two car parks in, in Europe that use them, where you get, you know, minus whatever temperatures and snow, and it's still working quite okay. I think the main reason is more of a sustainable, using a sustainable material, right? compared to using something that's not as sustainable. Um, the issues you get are what uh, I mentioned, cracking, shrinkage, 
um, deterioration due to the climatic changes, right? Temperature changes. Uh, I've used bamboo cladding in a school in Dubai and the bamboo sort of also cracked, right? Despite all our uh, attempts to pre-drill or even have a saw cut, the bamboo still cracked because it's, it's uh, you're putting something in a foreign land, right? Where bamboo doesn't thrive and it's got to struggle. <laughs> That's how I, I would see it. Unless you can find some wonderful coating uh, that you can stabilize it or protect it. I think one day, you know, one of the students might come up with a nano coating or, or some, some special coating that will help us um, in that way. Thanks, that makes good sense. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Eugene, again, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to be here and for answering our questions. Um, I think we've really learned a lot from your expertise, even just six years in, I'm sure you've learned so much. I know you have a lot more to learn <laughs> uh, as we all do, but thank you very much for, for being here. So if everyone can just uh, kind of thank, uh, join me again and thanking you, Jen. Um, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, so with that, uh, like I said, we do have a lot to cover in the hands-on portion today. I'm just going to go ahead and turn things right over to Brandon and Dan, who are a couple of our material researchers at the Materials Lab. Yes, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm a fifth year undergrad architecture student and I'm entering my last semester here at UT. And I'm Dan Perenia. I'm an MLA graduate student, I'm in my second year. Um, and so I'll be doing the demonstration after Brandon gives kind of a little intro to what it's been like uh, coming up with this and doing a lot of the prototyping and encountering some of the problems that uh, Eugene mentioned. Yeah, so like Dan said, we'll just quickly breeze through um, kind of our process through designing the plant stand that we will be building tonight, starting with research and practice, um, followed by prototyping, showing you guys the final design, um, and then um, the stuff that happens earlier this semester being the production and um, yeah, the cultivation of the bamboo. So just to um, quickly show you guys how we began our research process, we um, collected a number of different lashing techniques um, using the tutorials we found online. There are many really wonderful tutorials that inspired us um, on YouTube that you guys are um, welcome to check out after the talk. But um, we began by just collecting a bunch of um, common techniques and we practiced them on smaller scraps of bamboo. Um, some of them were more successful than others. Um, the Mark II being one of them that we found a lot of success, success in that we will be using um, tonight. Um, we also tried simply even zip ties, which uh, believe it or not, were not as um, strong as we thought they would be. Um, a couple other things we tried, um, we tried drilling holes because we um, were interested in the idea of a pegged member and that was um, quite successful. Um, we also tried um, this cut called the two ear cut where you, um, basically create this joint, like similar to a Eugen um, presented where you're kind of trying to do something that is typically done using timber, but um, we found that it wasn't quite successful because um, like you said, bamboo is very prone to splitting. So it's, um, especially when you're constructing about 50 kits, it's uh, not a great idea. So um, the other idea we had early on was um, possibility of a tripod, maybe for an easel, but we opted for the plant stand instead. So here are a couple um, prototypes that we um, developed over the past um, several months. Um, early on, um, we recognized the necessity of a horizontal bracing, um, both at the top and bottom. So the image you see at the far left, um, you can see that it has um, the pegs members um, uh, running across long ways, um, but there are no members at the bottom. So this um, meant that the legs were not very sturdy. They, would, um, they were prone to tip over. And for the next iteration that you see next to it, um, we did include um, a lower member, but uh, this too wasn't very successful. Uh, early on, we were also playing with the idea of it being shorter, but we ultimately went for something a little bit taller. So the plant stand that you um, have at home today looks a little bit more like the two images you see on the right. So these are two feet tall plant stands. Um, the uh, image next to the one on the right 
um, you can see um, is pretty close to the final. It, uh, the pot is supported by the pegged members. Um, and one thing we recognized from this design was the necessity of a, something to hold the saucer. So that came in to later designs. Also at the bottom, we recognized the necessity of um, cross bracing because there was still a bit of racking. Um, the stand wasn't super sturdy yet. So um, in the final, uh, final to, in the image on the right, um, which was right before our final iteration. You can see that we included that um, X bracing at the bottom with, with much more success. So, so this is the final design that we came up with. Um, it includes a lot of the like really um, most successful elements that we had um, developed or kind of come across uh, through our research. So um, at the very top, you see the, so if you're looking at the elevation that's on the, um, top uh, left, you can see that the uppermost horizontal member is a pegged insertion, which will support the pot. Um, directly below that are two Mark II connections, um, which will support the saucer. And then at the bottom, you have the fish mouth members, which will kind of add that stability that is needed in the plant stand. So the image you see at the on the right is um, what we hope all of you are able to develop tonight. and. Um, we recognize like it is um, quite a bit of a process, so we don't anticipate that not many of you might finish entirely tonight, which is completely fine. But we're hoping that after tonight, you leave with um, the ability to kind of finish it on your own. And if not, that's totally fine. Feel free to reach out to us and we'll help you. So um, earlier this year, um, we were able to um, after we had our final design, it was time to start um, cultivating some bamboo. So in January, um, uh, many members of our team, we met up at um, Carol Meke's um, bamboo farm, who um, I can see she has joined us here tonight. So thank you for joining. Um, she is the president of the Texas Bamboo Society. Um, and while on site, we participated in every step of the cultivation process, which included the uprooting of the culms, as you can see in the image on the left. So we started collecting them. Um, after this, we would cut the branches off, um, which you can see kind of happening in the lower right image. And then um, finally, we cut the poles down to about 12 foot increments. And then by the end of the day, we had collected about 60 total poles. So it was quite, uh, quite a lot of work. So after this, we hauled it to the school's um, wood shop where um, basically we uh, prepared the kits. So um, we drilled holes using the drill presses and we cut all the members down to varying lengths. Um, and um, we also used the um, elliptical sander to um, create the fish mouth. So yeah, so here we are today with uh, everyone has a kit and um, we're really excited to kick this off. So from here, I'll pass it on to Dan. Okay. Hey, y'all. Um, so Brandon kind of let, let y'all know about the objectives. So we're going to be going through the knots and the, these lashing techniques. Uh, they're, they can be kind of tricky. And so, you know, what we're hoping is that I'm going to lead you through uh, basically four different knot techniques that you're going to be using. And we're hoping that each person can at least get kind of one of each knot that we're using, one of each lashing that we're using. Um, and then you can, from there, build out the rest of the plant stand. Um, it's just, a, it can be, the learning curve can be kind of steep. So I'm gonna go through like almost painstakingly slowly how to do it because it it's just really confusing sometimes. Um, and so, you know, I would say if you, so hopefully everyone has their kit kind of with them. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through each piece. Um, if you don't have your kit with you, I would definitely go get it. Um, and if you also just wanna preface, like if you have questions, um, you, can, you can ask them live or you can put them through the chat um, and kind of if, if there's sort of this critical mass, we can pause and everything. Um, I just don't want anyone to get too far behind. Um, so in your kit, you have the leg pieces, which are the 24 inch pieces, uh, the peg mount poles, 
um, the fish mouth poles and the Mark II poles. So those are each of the poles, they have a different lashing technique uh, for each of those. Uh, you have some small dowel pieces. Um, oh, and sorry, I should mention too. So Brandon, uh, if you can see, he has his feed uh, of his, his phone uh, just facing, he's gonna be building it with us. Um, so you can kind of follow along. Um, so if you, if you wanna uh, either drag his tile to the top or you can pin it to the top, um, that may be helpful while we're going through these knots. Um, you can also uh, kind of change the view to where it's a split side-by-side -side view, um, which may be helpful uh, potentially. Uh, so you can kind of see, you know, maybe a different angle or something. Um, and so, yeah, to go back to this, we have dowels, uh, the cord. We have a paper clip. We gave each person a couple of extra paper clips. That, that's actually going to be turned into a little needle that's going to help you with the fish mouth uh, lashing. And we'll, we'll go over all of this. You have some moldable glue, and that's going to help you with the peg mount. Um, you have a pot and a saucer. That's for the plant, obviously. Um, does everyone kind of have their kit with them? People ready? Kind of just like scrolling through. I see one person. I can like see them making it. That's really great. Okay. So your workspace, if you have, it's, it's hopefully you're viewing this from a laptop, it'll be a little bit easier, but if not, it's okay. Um, it just may be, you may wanna keep those YouTube videos that I sent out to, to everyone. Um, those can be kind of helpful to go back and forth if you need to. Um, this is just a situation where having a lot of windows open may, may help you out. Um, if you have like a yoga, if you have a yoga block, that's, that's going to be really helpful just because they're really lightweight, but you can use books. Um, you, you're going to need, uh, when you're, when you start connecting all of the, uh, pieces together, you're going to kind of have to support it, uh, to, to do that. You're going to kind of find as you're making this, that it's, it can be a little bit strange, like how you're tying everything together. Um, you, you may, you know, put it like, but put a piece between your arm and hold it, or maybe rest something against your desk, um, or hold something in between your knees. It can be kind of finicky. Uh, if you have scissors, you will definitely need those. Uh, and if you have pliers, you don't necessarily need them, but they can help you when we're doing the fish mouth joint with the needle. Sometimes it's harder to pull those, uh, to, to do a certain aspect of that. Um, and okay, so just gonna give people a little bit of time to kind of get everything together. Um, hopefully, I'm just kind of going through people's feeds to see if people look ready. They look pretty ready, okay. Um, so I'm just going to go over the square knot. Uh, this is a really basic knot, but if, so you may already know this, um, but this is going to be how we finish off all of the knots. So it's really important that you know how to do it. Um, otherwise, all of your knots will just get loose and fall apart. So um, let's see if I can slow this down. Yeah, there we go. So you start it just like a normal knot, basically like that. Uh, so the left piece is on top and you're just gonna take the left piece, you're gonna cross it over the right piece. And then you're gonna take that right piece and just thread it through. Um, do who uh, are kind of already knows how to do this just out of curiosity, because it's possible like most, most people do, but also realize um, knots are kind of Okay, okay, good. So I'm seeing that some people, it's a good refresher. And so this is what it looks like. Um, if you, yeah, and then you can tighten it. So this is gonna be how you finish off every single knot. Um, 
So kind of just going through, Brandon's got it. Looks like, Ingrid, do you have it? You do, great, okay. Um, okay. So moving on. So this is kind of gonna be like the warm up sort of fancy knot. Um, this is the knot that kind of helped me and Brandon understand like how knots work basically. Um, so this is actually the fish, it, this is for the fish mouth joint, which is gonna be the piece um, at the bottom. I don't know if Brandon, if you can kind of show like on the model where the, well, no, it's here, sorry. So down here, it's this piece. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the knot that keeps them together. Um, and that's actually gonna be the same knot that we use later to hook the two uh, longer poles uh, that are gonna hold the saucer. So you're gonna need um, those two fish mouth poles uh, and just cord. And that's all you need for this one. Let's see. How many people? And also, um, some of these videos, you know, like you're going to find that it's kind of uh, tricky, like working with the string. Uh, so the cord, we cut all of them to a six foot length, but you don't actually, for a lot of them, you won't use all of the cord. Um, so it can be a little bit tangled. Um, and so it'll kind of give you time to like sort that out because uh, it does make it a little bit more difficult uh, when you're doing that. Okay, Brandon, are you, are we ready for the Mark II? Great. Okay. So you're going to start with your two pieces like this. It's gonna be easiest if you just put that one on the top going left to right, uh, just so you can follow along. Um, and you're gonna take your cord and you're just gonna make sure that you fold it in half basically so that when you are working with each end, it's the same length on each end. So that's what I'm doing here is just kind of finding the middle of it. And what you're gonna do is you're going to put that part on the underside of the bottom piece like that. Um, so you'll just do that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the right side and the left side, and we're gonna pull it over the top piece. Um, and then those two pieces are gonna go under the bottom piece. Let's see, so. Just kind of like watching. Kind of looks like people are about there. Nice, okay. So you're just gonna take them and you're gonna push, you're gonna take the left and the right and bring them under that bottom piece. And they're gonna cross over and then you're gonna go back over at the top. Uh, and you'll basically do this same process uh, three times, I believe, or four times maybe. Um, and you could do it more if you if you really wanted to. So it's crossed under, and now we're drawing the, both sides over. And so you're going to just do the same thing. You're going to cross them under each other under the bottom piece. Um, let's see. And so here we go, the left piece and the right piece are gonna go under there. And you can uh, kind of see where we're gonna go with this. We're gonna do this a couple more times. Um, and we've got the photo of the knot at the top right, just to kind of show you kind of where we're headed. And let's see. How are people doing? Looks, looks like people are getting it, that's nice.
And so it can kind of take a little while to untangle everything since the rope is so long. Um, that's just kind of something you'll find in all of these. And so you're gonna just wrap it over again. And so I'm gonna kind of speed the video up a little bit more uh, from half speed to three quarter speed. Um, just because I think at this point, you probably are gonna understand what's, what's going on. If you need to slow down um, or you are stuck, uh, feel free to let us know. So at this point, we're just doing the same thing again. It's going under, uh, they're crossing over and then they're going back over the top. And so do the same thing. And so you can do this, you know, as many times as you want really. Um, and it'll just make it a lot stronger, um, but eventually it'll get too bulky and it won't be something you wanna do. Um, hey so Dan, can I have Brandon freeze on the backside of it? Just uh, next to the camera, just so I can make sure mine's the right thing. Yeah, sure. And I guess I should mention too, um, and this is going to be kind of the case with all of these. You may you may find that like oh it's like the the cord is crossing or something or it's not like perfectly stacked up against each other, um, and that's actually okay. Um, that's not going to affect the strength of your knot. It's more just the way it looks, kind of like how Eugene showed those really ornamental lashings there are less ornamental ways to do it and have it still be the same strength. Um, so just because it looks maybe a little strange doesn't mean that it's not gonna hold your uh, plant stand together. Okay, did, did that help? Cool. Okay, so this is called frapping the knot and I'm gonna slow it down. So you're gonna cross Oops. Those two pieces like that uh, over each other. And what you're going to do is you're going to pull the left side and the right side underneath the top piece. And what this is going to, what we're doing here is we're basically going to cinch together all of those lashings that we just did. And so that's going to tighten everything up a lot. It's going to make it really sturdy. Um, I'm going to just rewind a little bit because I think we probably kind of missed that. So you go from here. So you've, you've, you know, you've gone under and crossed un, uh, under and you're just crossing them over. And then those two pieces will go under the top piece. And so you'll kind of, the reason we are doing this one first is because this is kind of the same logic for a lot of lashing techniques, you will kind of basically wrap a cord around something a bunch of times. And then in the lateral direction, you will kind of tighten everything and that will cinch up all of, uh, all of that work you did. So you can see it here, the right and the left have gone under that top piece. And you're just gonna cross them over each other again. And then you go right back under that top piece again. And so at this point, you can kind of start tightening it. Like if you want to kind of pull to the left and to the right pretty hard, you'll see that it's starting to get more, feel like it's more sturdy and like you're, like you're really doing something. Um, and so, and, and with this, you know, you, you don't want to do it too, too many times. It's not like the lashing portion. Um, we're just going to do this, I think one or two more times. So we're going under the right side and with the left side, we're just going to cross over again. This is really, really slow. And so you can kind of tighten it up. And a lot of these knots you'll kind of find, like you'll kind of be tightening as you go. Um, it's it can feel really um, loose and chaotic, but eventually kind of as all of these forces add up together, um, it actually becomes pretty sturdy. Um, but until that moment, it, things can feel pretty shaky and um, kind of feels like it's not gonna be held together. So at this point, we're just tying the square knot. Um, 
And if you're someone who like knows a lot about knots, there's a bunch of other ways you could do this. Um, but we're going to do the square knot because that's the one that I know how to do. So how are we doing? Let's see what's going on in the chat. Cool. And uh, it looks like Brandon's kind of finishing it up. Great. So this is what it looks like. Um, how many folks are kind of at this point? Are people, okay, it looks like some people got it. That's great. Nice, at least, that's wonderful. You guys are picking it up a lot faster than we did. So that's great. Um, I'll just kind of give people a little bit of time to tighten things up. And so once it's all tight and you feel like it's tight enough, you can use your scissors and cut it. Um, and then really you're just going to set that aside uh, because we're not going to go back to the fish mouth uh, for another couple slides. Okay. So we're kind of we're going to move in a different direction now. We're going to like actually start building uh, or sort of adding to those poles the legs that you that you have. So what you're going to need now, so you can put that piece that we just uh, made aside. Um, hopefully, people kind of got to a point where they feel like they, you know, kind of understand how that, how that works. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to work on the peg mount lash. Uh, and so uh, everything that you, Jen, said, um, you know, all of the bamboo is just highly irregular. Um, it's really, really hard to uh, sort of make like an Ikea type thing that's going to work for everyone. Um, so some of you may find that your uh, poles are kind of small compared to the hole. And so what we've done is we've included some uh, Subaru, which is this fun moldable glue. Um, to help make that uh, a little bit easier to deal with. Um, so first you're gonna take, so you'll need your peg mount poles, those little dowel rods and your moldable glue. Um, you'll take your one of your peg mount poles and you'll put dowel rods through it. Um, and those dowel rods are gonna eventually, they're they end up being a pretty strong lashing. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see Brandon's feed there. Um, so with the Sugru, this is gonna be kind of helpful to look at, at Brandon's feed uh, because I don't actually have a video of me inserting the Sugru. But what you'll do um, is you'll just put, put that piece into, um, or actually, sorry. So, what we found helps really is pretty effective is to take a very tiny piece of the Sugru and to kind of line the hole with it and then push the uh, piece into it. And then from there, you can kind of add Sugru to it. Um, and another thing I'll say is some of these rods are kind of, you might want to test uh, kind of each leg and each rod to see kind of which fits where. Some of the fits can be really tight. Um, which will make your life easier kind of in the long run. Um, but you just want to make sure that each one fits in a way that works for you. Um, and I'll just kind of give people a little bit of time to do that. Uh, and you can see on Brandon's feed kind of what he's doing with the Sugru over there, uh, just preparing it. And I also just want to mention kind of while we're doing this. Um, so that Sugru is, is really great, but it does dry in about a day. So what that means is if you, when you're working on this, uh, after we kind of go through the knots, you should really prioritize getting the other peg mount lashings done. Because if you need, if you need that Sugru, it's going to be too dry to work with like by tomorrow. 
Um, so maybe, you know, if, if, if you pick up the, the peg mount, maybe in the breakout rooms uh, towards the end, we can, you, we can kind of go over those because um, those would be a good one to finish kind of quickly, or at least just today if, if you can. Um, so you can see Brandon's feed kind of got the sugar there. Um, let's see, how are folks doing? Nice. And some of y'all may find that your uh, peg mount pole fits like perfectly into that hole. Um, if that's the case, that's just great. That's great for you. You don't, you don't really need the Sugro. Um, sometimes that happens. That's wonderful. So where are we at with folks? It looks like people are getting it. That's great. And I mean, with the Subaru, just kind of remember you're doing it potentially four times. So just splitting it into fourths will help you out just so you don't accidentally run out. Okay. Brandon, how are, how are things going on your end? Look pretty good. Yeah, good. Nice. Okay. So let's see. Kind of looks like folks are putting it together. Great. Okay, I am going to move on unless folks need, I'll give, I'll give people a little bit more time. And it takes a little while to kind of uh, smush the Sugru into that spot. Um, and the nice thing is, even if it looks, you may kind of be feeling it and realize and think it looks a little funky, but it will actually, um, the knot is going to cover it. Yeah, great timing. Uh, Ludmila. Uh, the, the cord is going to end up covering it. Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna push on. So this is the clove hitch, and this is gonna be, um, this is part of the peg mount lash, which is uh, the, the peg mount piece is what we just used Subaru to uh, put into that leg. Um, and so this knot is really basic, but it's actually kind of confusing to understand conceptually. So I'm gonna go through it uh, really slowly. Um, and this is gonna be what um, starts off the peg mount lash. So you'll, so in this video, I don't have it pushed into the, um, the leg, but you'll just do it while it's pushed into the leg. Um, and if it, if it, you know, wobbles or something or comes out, it's okay. So with this, you're going to need, so you already have your peg mount poles and you have your, your dowel rods and you've already done that. Uh, you just need one piece of cord and you're going to want to, uh, fold it in half. And I know that can take a little time, so kind of. The nice thing is I, I filmed these, um, like all of, all of the real life of me like fumbling around. Um, so hopefully, you know, 
it's not always smooth sailing doing these knots. So I'm gonna rewind a little bit. So now it takes a while to get that, that cord in half. Uh, so what you'll do, let's see. Yeah, people are still kind of working with the cord. So once you have that sort of doubled in half, uh, you'll just make sure that um, that midpoint is at the peg mount. And so you'll start with the bottom piece going out towards the left and the top piece going to the right. And you're going to take that bottom piece, the, the piece on the left side that runs under it, and you're going to pull it over to the right of the portion of the cord that's running over the top, like this. So I'll just leave it here for a little bit. I know it's kind of, it gets a little bit confusing to be looking back and forth a lot. Can you explain that again? Yeah, sure. Here, I'll just um, I'll just rewind it. Uh, so you'll have the bottom part will be going out to the left, and the top part of the cord will be going to the right. And you'll take that bottom part. And you'll loop it over to the right over that cord. I don't actually know who asked that question, but um, does that does that help? I'm also wondering if maybe Brandon can show kind of where he's at if he can show a different angle or something. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep going. Or if folks need more time, let's see. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna press on. And so you've gone over into the right, and you're gonna kind of hold that part that you just went over uh, with your finger, and it'll kind of create a little loop. This is me fumbling around trying to do that, but eventually it happens. Um, so you'll hold it there, and you'll pull it under, and then you're gonna take that piece, you're gonna thread it through the hole and just that hole, not, not through anything else. And then you'll kind of pull it through. And I know this can be kind of tricky with the uh, length of the cord. This is actually one of the knots where you do kind of need all of it. So I'll just pause it here. Oh, wait. Because this kind of shows you the shape of the knot, uh, which can be kind of helpful. Let's see. How are folks doing? Nice. Okay. So some people got it. That's great. So I'll just keep it here for a second. Um, actually, this one goes through it twice. So I'm just going to play it and you can kind of see it again. And maybe like that angle or a different angle or something will help you out. Um, so you'll do this and you'll tighten it. And once you have it tightened, uh, you're going to push the knot over to uh, the dowel rod that's closest to the leg. Um, Cause that's going to be kind of what ends up starting the, the knot and providing a lot of the tension for against that leg. How are people doing? Good, great, okay. And so this is just doing it again. Uh, do people kind of have it? I can't really tell. The people who have their video on, Seem to have seem to have it down, which is great. Um, but if if you need more time, that's totally fine. 
Okay, Ingrid is doing good, great. That's what we love to hear. And so is Zig. Okay, so there you go. That's the clove hitch. And so now we're gonna kind of move on to one that's I'm just gonna keep on upping the difficulty with these, or at least just the complexity. So we're gonna to go to the peg mount. So you've got your peg and your dowel and your sugru. You have the clove hitch. Now we're going to make this lashing here. And so it's kind of similar to uh, like in logic to the Mark II. So basically you're gonna be using the dowel rods and you're gonna be wrapping uh, that cord around the dowel rod and then around the leg back to the other dowel rod. And you're gonna be doing that kind of both the left and the right side. Uh, and that's gonna provide a lot of tension and pull and it's gonna pull the pull into the leg upright. And then you're gonna tighten that lashing. You're gonna frap it. Um, and that's gonna be what really causes it to tighten up and become really sturdy. And this one is a really sturdy uh, knot. So what you'll need, so you have everything that you need at this point. So I'm just gonna go, th go through it. Are folks kind of ready? Um, so you'll start off with the cords going towards the underside of the peg like this. And it's okay. So the clove hitch kind of forms an X. Um, if you can position that towards the top, that's great. If you don't, and it's on the bottom, like if if you can see my cursor, if this is a, if this is where the X is, that's fine. Um, it's not gonna be the end of the world. Um, and a lot of the knots are like that. Like it's, it's the orientation is not quite as important as what you think it would be structurally. It more is just going to be how kind of like elegant your knot looks. So what we're going to do is now that you have those under, pulled under the uh, dowels, what you're going to do is you're going to wrap the right and the left side around the leg. And I guess it, you'll find a way that works for you to hold this. Like some people like to hold that piece between their legs and like rest it on a table in front of them. I had to kind of film this with it like wedged in between my arm. Um, but whatever works for you. So you're gonna take, uh, this is, I guess, the left side, um, and you're gonna wrap it over the uh, peg. So I'm gonna kind of pause just to make sure that people get it to that point, because this is basically what you're gonna do on each side uh, three times. So, Kind of looks like people are getting it. But these videos are, are pretty pretty slowed down, so hopefully it gives folks time. So this is doing it on the other side. So you crossed them over, um, and this is just that other side. And so you can kind of see where we're going with this. Like the side that I'm holding right there is going to go over to the right side and uh, go over the top mount or the uh, the dowel rod. Um, and so, yeah, so it's okay if the cords cross over each other. I tried to make it so that they kind of all line up. Um, it can be kind of hard to do that sometimes. Um, and eventually they kind of have to cross, um, but you can get it to where they all line up like this. Uh, if you're kind of, if you're just like a little, a little careful. Um, so this is, going again with that side and pulling it over. And then we have the piece that was left over here that I was holding on to. I'm just gonna go over that uh, dowel rod. How, how are people doing? Because this is kind of a spot where it may be easy to get um, confused. Okay, Janelle is doing good, that's great. Um, 
Okay, so we're wrapping this over that piece. And then this is kind of the final time when we are gonna wrap it over the dowel rod. And so I also just wanna mention like, you're probably at this point um, that pole, the peg mount pole is probably like really sideways. Um, and that's totally fine. We're gonna adjust it as we go. And that's kind of like a theme of working with these knots. They are, you're kind of making these like tiny little adjustments kind of all the time. Okay, so this is the last wrap over. So once you wrap it over for the last time, the third time on each side, it'll go over and you'll just kind of hold it with your finger on the inside. So I'm just gonna pause it there. Um, kind of let people get to that point. And I think Brandon is kind of at that point. Are you at that point, Brandon? Cool, it looks like we're close. How are people doing? Okay, people seem to be doing great. You can also just say that you're doing great. But a thumbs up is great too. <laughs> um, okay, so this is gonna be the part where you start to kind of tighten it. Um, this is a good time to sort of adjust that pole and try and make it uh, at a right angle if you can. Um, but you'll kind of see that like you'll, as you start tightening it, you, you're just gonna keep making adjustments. That's just kind of how it goes. So, What we're gonna do now, um, we're gonna take this, these two pieces that are at the bottom and they're basically gonna cross, or sorry, yeah. So you're gonna pull them, and I'm just gonna pause it because it's a little bit confusing. This is a little bit of a jump. So you have those two that you pulled over the top. Those are gonna now be pulled straight up and they'll be between, so the left and the right will be between the dowel and the leg. Um, so basically you have to be able to tighten all of these cords. So that's the only spot where you can do that. So you're gonna cross the left and the right over each other. And like at this point, you're probably gonna start feeling like you're gonna feel it start to tighten up and all the work kind of start to pay off. And so basically what you do here is similar to what we did with the Mark II. So it's the right and the left are gonna cross over each other on the top. And then you're gonna go down to the bottom of the right and the left. And they're gonna cross over each other and you're just gonna be tightening uh, that point. So you'll kind of just be pulling the right to the right and the left to the left to get that tightened. And I think we're gonna do this two more times, uh, I believe. So this is between the leg and the peg? Yes. Sorry, it gets really blurry here. And so we're just crossing it over and we're gonna go up top, do it again. And we're just gonna keep tightening it. And so you'll kind of start like really tightening it and you're just gonna have to keep adjusting that pole as you go. Uh, but eventually it should feel pretty tight. Uh, and so now that we've wrapped it around and tightened it, we're just gonna finish it off on the bottom with a square knot. If you like, for some reason are finishing it off on the top with a square knot, that's totally fine. Um, you could wrap it around again. It may just mean that you only wrapped it once um, and that's okay.
So when you're doing the square knot, it's helpful for that first knot to just like really tighten it up. And then the second knot just kind of finishes it. So this is kind of, this is what you end up with. Um, Viola, you have done it. Now I was supposed to say voila. So this is kind of what it looks like. Depending on how you do it, you can, you can make these a bit more stacked on top of each other. Um, this is definitely an art. Uh, and it takes a while to get these knots. Um, how are people doing? Nice. Ray has done it. That's really good. Cool. Okay. Let's see who else has their video on. Okay, looks like things are going well for folks. So that's great. That's one of the more complicated knots. Um, is everyone kind of with video at a point where they feel good about it? Great, so you can cut those pieces off um, of the square knot, the excess, uh, if you want to, or you can do it later, it doesn't, either way is fine. So now we're gonna do, we're gonna go back to that piece that we did the Mark II knot on, the first one. Uh, so this is called the fish mouth lash. So this one is fun uh, because we are going to use a paper clip and we're gonna turn it into a little needle. So for this, you're going to need the fish mouth poles, which we've already, we've already made um, into that cross brace, uh, cord, the legs. Uh, this is gonna be where having a block or a book for support is gonna be helpful. Uh, for this particular, for the first knot, it doesn't actually matter. But once you start uh, putting it all together, uh, that book is gonna really help you kind of uh, keep everything together while you're trying to lash everything. So what, let's see, how, how are people doing? Does everyone have a cord in there? Great, looks like people are there, wonderful. So, oh, sorry, I should go, before we go into this, I need to show you how to turn your paper clip into a needle. Uh, this is gonna be really helpful to watch Brandon do it. Um, I did not uh, have a video of it, but you can see kind of what we did with the paper clip. Basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna unfold it. And then in the middle, you're just gonna pinch it like as hard as you can, basically. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of like pretend like this is a video and Brandon's the video. So he's unfolding it. Brandon, if you wanna like chime in too. That's yeah, great. so yeah, it's very simple. I'm just, if you're watching my live feed right now, you can see that I've unfolded the paper clip to make basically a U shape. And we want this bit right here to be as um, tight as possible so that way it can fit through the holes, the drill holes. So you might, it might help to fold it backwards in order to um, get like a tighter little U shape. But when you're done, when you're done, it should look something like this, where you have just a nice tight U that can fit through these drilled holes. And if you have pliers, you can just crush that corner with pliers and it will kind of automatically do what you want. But you can also, like Brandon said, uh, just pull the pieces over each other. So like you can see on this image of the paperclip how one side is like folded over to the other side. Um, it's because I kind of pulled it that way. So let's see, how are people doing? Nice, okay. Seems like folks have it, hopefully. Um, 
it is really helpful to get that bend as tight as you can. Um, this one is like pretty easy to kind of understand, but it can just be kind of tricky to actually thread the uh, cord through. So I'm just gonna jump into it. So what you'll do is you have your paperclip needle and you have your cord and what you're gonna do is you're gonna put your cord through that little paperclip needle. So what we're gonna be doing is first we're gonna run this piece of cord through it once. Um, and we're gonna kind of, there's gonna be a shorter piece that kind of hangs out. And then the longer piece, uh, we're gonna to switch to the other end and that's gonna be what wraps around the pole uh, three times and goes through the hole on the opposite uh, three times. And so this one, like you can see, like it, this, like this needle, it's giving me a lot of trouble. Um, and so this may be your experience as well. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna leave like eight inches or so of that uh, cord. So you're gonna pull like, you know, it can be more than that actually. More is better than less in this case. And you're going to just take that and you're gonna run it through again on the other side. And so that kind of just gives us a place to start with. And it can be kind of tricky uh, getting the needle to run all the way through. At the beginning, it is hopefully a little bit easier. Um, sometimes you can luck out and it's just really easy all the way, uh, but this can definitely give you trouble. Um, and it's, that's totally okay. So I pull that through. And just going to give it a good tighten. How are people doing? Are they? Yeah, good. OK. Seems like people got it. So we're going to switch from the short length to the long length. And from there, you're going to put the needle on the long length of the cord. So this is the part where it gets kind of messy um, because of how long that cord is. Um, but what you're going to do is, I'm just gonna pause it to explain this because this is, I think, a part where that can be confusing. You're gonna wrap the cord around the leg and you're gonna pull that cord through the end, that, uh, through the hole that the short uh, lashing is coming through. Um, and it kind of, like that should sort of make sense, but if for some reason it, that doesn't happen, it just it won't work at all. Um, so you'll take the long end of the rope and kind of get the needle all set up. And now we're just going to wrap that around the pole. Um, and so like in this situation, so this gets a little bit, a little bit messy. This is the knot that I think feels like the most chaotic when you're making it, um, because it really doesn't feel, uh, tight until like the very end. And it even kind of takes doing all the other knots um, on the other th three ends uh, to make it feel like it's really sturdy. But once that happens, um, it, it does end up being really sturdy. It's kind of how these knots all work. It's a lot of like really loose forces working together to make a uh, strong force. And so you can kind of just see like it gets a little Things can be a little tangled, but you're just gonna take that long piece, use the needle and run it through the other side. Uh, that hole that has the short length coming out of it. And so when you're guiding it through, it may take a couple of tries, potentially. Um, you may like catch another piece of rope through it. Um, and that's okay. Uh, 
you can just kind of untangle it. Uh, you can pull it apart and just pull it through. Um, I think you'll see that through uh, the second pass. So you've pulled it through. And I'll also say too, like you might see that it's gone through like this piece right here where it feels kind of awkward, that's okay. Um, it'll still work. And so you're just gonna do this two more times and then you're gonna, and then like the other knots that we've done, you'll sort of tighten it up a little bit and that will give it some extra sturdiness. How is it going with everyone? Good, okay, cool. I think once you kind of get it with this one, it's pretty easy to sort of forge ahead. Um, I, the trickiest part is really pulling the needle through each time. So in this time it gets kind of stuck. Um, you just have to try it a couple of times um, to thread it through. Yeah, like so this one it takes a really long time. So I think on this I pull it through and it catches one of the pieces inside. But what you can do is if that happens, you just pull the piece that you accidentally caught and you just get it out of the needle. And once you pull it through and start tightening it, it'll just go back to normal. So it's not the end of the world. You can kind of see, and this is, you know, this is what I meant about it. it just feels really chaotic when you're making it, especially when it's the first one. Um, but once you start to tighten it up, it'll, it'll feel a little bit more normal and a little bit sturdier. And so this just happens, this is just the third time to do it. Um, one of your fish mouth poles doesn't have holes in it. That is a problem. Um, well, we can get you one that does have holes in it. Um, but I would still try and do this because it, um, once you understand how to make this one, it's pretty easy to, uh, to replicate. Um, so this is the third wrap. I'm just going to speed it up a little bit because I think at this point, probably kind of get probably understand where we're going now. So once this goes through, we're just gonna use the right and the left side to finish the knot off. And it's just gonna end up wrapping over the top and under the bottom and over the top and tightening uh, to kind of give us some more strength and to tighten that knot. And like a lot of times you'll see this knot uh, used um, in a spot where it'll where it'll be right above the node because you can kind of the node is always like the thicker point of bamboo and so if you use this this knot right above the node it's usually pretty sturdy because it won't slide down uh, and a lot of joints are are like that you kind of have to use the nodes strategically um, and so you might find that. Um, you know, when you're trying to orient this, we have this kind of set about four to five inches from the bottom of the pole. Um, but if there's a node in the way or something, you might kind of need to move it lower or higher, depending on kind of what works. And so like this one took a really long time to get, to get through. I had a lot of trouble with this one. Um, but eventually, you know, like I said, you can get it untangled and it'll just work out fine. How are people doing? How many times do you go through, if you don't we, mind? Yeah, you are gonna go through uh, three times. And really what limits you on this is just 
the size of the hole. Like if you could try and go through a fourth time, it, it'll be even stronger, but it's just tricky to uh, get it through uh, that many times. And so I'm gonna back up a little bit. So at this point, are people kind of at this point where they've wrapped it over? Um, so you'll kind of see like you can, once you've wrapped it three times, you can, you can pull it and it'll just start to tighten um, a lot more. And what we're gonna do is just take the right and the left side and finish the knot off, kind of similar to the way we did it on the other, uh, on the other knots. So you've got your two sides here. You're going to wrap them over each other. And then you're going to wrap them under the other side like that. And you're going to go again over the top. I guess I'll slow this one down a little bit. Just because it's kind of fast. Um, so you'll just you'll just kind of wrap them. You could do it as many or, you know, I would, I would do it at least twice because um, it'll just give you some more strength. But so you want to try and keep it in between, you know, you want, you want the cord to ideally wrap over the, the cord that you've already worked with. That just kind of helps hold it in place. And so like you can kind of see like this is sort of like a weaker version of the peg mount lash like there's only a, instead of the pegs there it's just the hole and so you don't have quite as much leverage to tighten it. Um, so just a different joint to, to learn. So at this point, this is just doing the square knot to tie it off. And I'm going to make this not so slow. And there you go. And so like when you're doing that first knot, that's a really good time to just like really cinch it down because that's kind of the, your last opportunity to do that. And that's kind of something, that's something you do with, with all of the knots that you finish in sort of this style where you're um, frapping it. And so there you go. Hopefully it's, uh, you know, kind of marginally tight. It may be kind of loose uh, and that's okay. Uh, these knots are, you know, some of them, it, it takes a lot of the knots working together for it to feel sturdy. Um, so even if it's kind of loose, don't, uh, don't get too disheartened. Um, I think you'll find that once you start connecting and doing all the other knots, that things start to become a lot sturdier. Okay, how are folks doing? It looks like people, okay, nice, really doing it, that's great. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Do you folks need more time or? Kinda looks like. I'll give people a little bit, little bit more time to kind of maybe cut those last pieces, uh, cut the rope a little bit. Um, and so what we're going to do after this is we're going to do the Mark II lash that we already learned how to do, but it's going to be the piece that ends up holding the pot. Um, and so with this one. Okay, so this is where we're at with this one. Um, I'm gonna go through this one kind of quickly. Um, the reason is that when it comes to making the plant stand, it's really helpful to connect these two poles last. Um, the nice thing about them is that they're really flexible. So if your plant stand is really, uh, sort of like twisting or like it's your bamboo poles are probably not perfectly straight. Um, 
having this last one be really flexible, you can kind of, you can tie these knots at any point along it because there's no holes involved or anything. It's just the uh, tension of the knot holding it in place. And you're gonna be putting a, a pot on it. So it's gonna make it even stronger because there's gonna be some force on it kind of constantly. Um, so I think what I would suggest is just do this like once on it um, and maybe and maybe not cut the knot off because you may find that you want to kind of um, take apart that knot and do it last. Um, so if you feel like you really got the Mark II knot, this will be like the ultimate test because we're just going to do it again, uh, but in a slightly different context. And so you can kind of see here in these photos, the Mark II holes are going to be on the inside uh, of the structure, and that's going to be what holds up the saucer. So this one um, is going to kind of go kind of quick. Um, But you'll just make, you'll want to make sure, and it's oriented the same way. So we have the top piece going uh, sort of left to right, even though it's sideways. Um, so you really can do the same thing. Um, it's the same setup as the other knot that we did first. And so like before, you just take the left and the right and you wrap it over and then it goes under, they cross, they go back over. This is one that once you start getting kind of accustomed to it, it just be, it becomes sort of like intuitive of what you should do because uh, it just gets stronger and stronger uh, kind of as you go, as you cross over and then cross under and you keep repeating that process. And this knot is nice too, because you really don't have to decide where exactly the piece is gonna be until the very end, uh, until when you tighten it. So you can kind of slip it around according to kind of what you need. Um, and so in this, I've started frapping it on the bottom side instead of at the, on the top of the top piece. Um, and that's, that's fine, you can, you can really start doing that whenever you want. So it's just slightly different than what we did. And this, at this point, it's helpful to use like a book to uh, prop up the, uh, the stand. Um, you may find that that's a lot, that that's really helpful. How are folks feeling about this particular knot? Like they kind of understand it? Because we're about to go into breakout rooms and this is probably kind of a good, time to maybe just sort of go into those breakout rooms or answer individual questions. Because um, I think kind of like we said, the most important thing to do is uh, those peg mount la lashings at the beginning. Um, but we can also kind of answer individual questions. Okay, so at this point, I'm just gonna automatically split everyone into two breakout rooms, um, either with Brandon and Dan. Um, and we'll just do that for the last uh, 10 minutes or so of this workshop to answer individual questions. And then we'll join back together just for the last five minutes to wrap up by seven. Okay, so you should have uh, received an invitation right now to, um, to break out into the separate rooms.
I want to talk to you, Jen, about uh, so I'm missing holes in, I guess, the fish mount tails. Um, also, I didn't get the glue, and for one of my pieces, it's like crisscrossed and not in the same direction. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but it's kind of completely opposite, almost. So, I don't know if this is fine, but just the other stuff. Are you on right if you're... I can't hear you, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, sorry, okay, so Janelle, you're not in Austin right now, right? No. Okay, so we'll we'll send you that stuff. We'll send you the Sugru. And then how many um, holes are you missing from the... Um, um, which this? Um, no, sorry, in the cross piece, the, the one that we did. Uh, for... I'm just missing one. Okay, one all right. And then have holes in both ends, so. Okay, sorry about that. No, no, you're good. And then since we're sending you some stuff anyways, we'll try to get one with better alignment. Yeah. I noticed that too with some of the pieces that I have, they're like way off, but yeah. I don't think that should be a problem. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it would be better if they were straight. So anything else? How are you doing? I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, this, I know this is a little bit wider than the rest, but it was pretty okay. much. Yeah, it looks like yours has a split in it too. Is that still working or? Yeah, I think it's still working. Okay. This is really stable, so. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, great. Well, I'll let you get to the breakout room if you had any questions for Brandon or Dan, but okay. we'll, we'll get those sent out to you. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Thank nice you. Nice to see you too, yeah. Yeah, you too. <laughs>
Okay, so I see we have just one person left in the breakout room. So we'll just give them um, the last 20 seconds to rejoin the main room. But we are coming up on seven o'clock for those of you on campus. I just heard the, the, uh, the clock tower going. So and it looks like it's completely dark out now, very different from when we started. Um, okay, so I think that's all of us back in the room. Um, it seemed like just bouncing between the two rooms that all of you have kind of gotten it. Um, so thank you very much. Um, great job both uh, to Dan and Brandon. Thank you so much for your help. Uh, as you saw in the beginning slides, it was really a lot of preparation for the workshop. So thank you for all of the work you did. Um, Brandon, Dan, anything you wanna say or anything else that um, anyone else wants to wrap up with before we take off? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy that people got it. Um, you know, it took us a really long time to learn all of these knots, so it's really nice to see that they can be taught and people can pick them up. Um, and just thanks for being patient and going and going with it and and trying to make the knots really well. I'm, I'm glad so many people were able to get them. Yeah, I was gonna say basically the same thing. I was really impressed with how all of you picked it up. It took us months to, to figure this out. So <laughs> it was really impressive to see you guys figure it out in like an hour and a half. So great job. Yeah, and and yes, please finish your, um, your stands. We would love to see them in use. Uh, we would love to see pictures that we can uh, share further. Um, and if you have any issues, again, if any uh, missing pieces, um, anything you need help with just you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to help you help make sure you finish the, the piece correctly. Okay, and also think a big thank you to Carol too for supplying the bamboo. Um, I, I know that in one of the breakout sessions, she offered to have people come over if you're interested in, in visiting her her place. Um, I know that it's it's easily findable on Google. So I think it's bamboo shoots and holes. Bamboo, bamboo, yeah, bamboo branch. Okay. Yeah. Bamboo. Bamboobranch.com. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yes. So Kate, I look forward to um, seeing you again here. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks all. Have a good night and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks guys. Bye.